Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our third live virtual presentation for 2023. This is the third year now that we've been doing these live presentations with a whole handful of ambassadors, and we love to show you our educational content. And today is very special because it is featuring one of my favorite pieces of equipment, the laser beam. As of this morning, we had 252 people registered from all over the US and the globe. Thank you for joining us from whatever time zone you are in right now. Let's go ahead and warm up that chat feature. Go ahead and drop in the chat. Let us know where you are viewing from today. And as a little bit of a hint, make sure you're using that chat feature throughout the presentation. That is going to be how you're gonna be eligible to win our giveaway at the end. Joining me today is the wonderful Carrie Spender, our education coordinator. My name is Kelly Gibson and I am the digital marketing strategist of TumbleTrack. I may be a little biased, but I think I have the best job in the whole world. TumbleTrack is really proud of our long history providing not only quality equipment, but education as well. We've met some great folks along the way and we love to collaborate with people like Ambassador Coach and Judge Leah. Before I turn the stage over to Leah, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a few tips and tricks about viewing our presentation today so you get the most out of it. Many of you have already found that chat feature. Go ahead and keep dropping in where you are viewing from if you're just getting logged in. Um, we are gonna be having a Q&A at the end. So if you're asking questions throughout the presentation, that's great. We will get time to try to answer as many of those as possible. And like I mentioned, stick around until the very end. We will be doing a $250 gift certificate drawing at the conclusion of the presentation. If you are joining late, leaving early, or not able to make it, a recording is going to be sent to everybody at the conclusion of the event as well. So you'll be able to go back, reference, watch videos, and take notes. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenter for today. Her face may be familiar if you haven't been following us on social media as she is featured on our social media all the time. She is a tumble track ambassador, a coach at Mid Michigan Gymnastics, and a well-decorated judge. We just celebrated in San Jose this past weekend her passing her level nine judging exam. Very exciting. Congratulations, Leah. All right. It's time to go ahead and turn it over to Leah. Here is our presentation, and I hope you all enjoy. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah. Um, I just wanted to say I'm super thankful for all of you for tuning in to watching this presentation. I'm super excited to share this concept with all of you. Um, it's something I'm really passionate about, and I hope you leave us some great information to take back to your home gyms. All right, so let's jump right in. Uh, most people have heard of the laser beam. I feel like when I'm talking to coaches and gym owners, most people have them in their gyms already. If they haven't, they know what it is, but few truly know the meaning behind the numbers and lines. So in this presentation, I will be explaining the number system. It's the secret to consistent, confident beam training. Um, I'll take you through the original creation of the concept, how to use it, how to explain it, and through some video examples, I'll show you how and why it works so well for athletes and coaches. So the number system is visually displayed by the numbers and lines you see on the laser beam. I've got a few of them with me right here. Um, it was created by master coach and tumble track innovator Leonard Isaacs. I was lucky enough to be coached by Leonard when I was younger, and he truly is the most intelligent person I've ever met. Um, he pours all of his energy into helping athletes succeed in gymnastics, no matter what level. And if you've met him, you know of his undeniable love for coaching. He brought the idea of the laser beam to tumble track with the intention of providing a wider, safer surface for athletes to train on, to better prepare them for a high beam, and to create a visual display of the number system. He developed the concept on parallel bars, took it to pommel horse, and then eventually brought it over to beam. The number system can be used on virtually all events, which I will go into later in the presentation. So now we're gonna show a short clip of Leonard explaining the creation of the number system in his own words. We started that on parallel bars. Um, you know, when a guy's swinging up and doing a pirouette, um, when he comes down to the other side, he has to be straight as he swings down so because he's gonna swing into another trick like say a stutz, okay? So as I'm looking at that, I'm saying, okay, well, let's just pretend 
that the left rail is number one, and then we have three in the middle, and five in the right rail with two and four where they belong. What do they do? Okay, so guys, when you swing up and do a pirouette, as you swing up, swing towards number two, which is, a, okay, they're over here, right? It's, it's near the left rail, but it's not over the ledge, it's near it. So they swing up, they go over there, and of course, eventually they fall back to the middle on the back half of the swing, they're coming down, so they end up back in the middle. So we started with this simple stuff on P-bars. All right, thank you, Leonard. So before I dive into the concept, just some of the main benefits to using the number system. It gives athletes a better sense of control over their skills, which reduces fear, which anyone who coaches beam, we know that's something that's super important to have. Um, it also gives coaches an easy way to communicate helpful corrections to the athlete, which reinforces a feeling of trust between the coach and athletes. Um, okay, so how does it work? The numbers and lines on the laser beam provide a visual for alignment of center of gravity over the beam. We've provided this picture so you guys can kind of have a visual cue if you happen to not be standing by a laser beam like I am. Um, but it's, it's all about alignment of center of gravity, kind of like what Leonard was talking about. It's weight shifting. It's putting your center of mass over different areas of the beam. So if I'm referencing two or four or three and a half or something, that doesn't mean that I want the athlete to stand on, like say the white line if I say four. Um, it's referencing the center of gravity, not where your actual foot is placed on the beam. You should always want your hands and feet to be as much in the middle as possible, which can be determined by the white lines on the laser beam, um, because the white line, the edges of the white line are actually the width of a competition beam. Um, so the best way to explain this is to, um, is to have you stand up. So, um, so the best way to understand this concept is to actually feel it. So wherever you are watching this presentation, if you have the space, I will invite you to stand up right now. Um, so stand with your feet together. I'm standing on the laser beam so I can picture it, but as you're standing with your feet together and you are centered over the middle, you are over number three. So you're in complete balance, feet are together, that's the middle. If you lean a little bit to your left, you're gonna feel yourself shift over number two. If you lean a little bit to the right, you're gonna feel yourself shift over four. So that's you moving your center of gravity. You're shifting over the center of the beam while your feet are staying still. If you pick up your left foot, I'm gonna move back a little bit so you can see. If you pick up your left foot, you're gonna feel yourself lean over number four. So if you can see when I'm standing on the white line on the right side of the beam. So I'm centered completely over number four right now. So what's happening right now is I'm doing a counterbalance because I'm not centered over both of my feet. If I lift up my left foot and I don't counterbalance, I just fall off the beam. So anytime you have one leg up in the air, there's a counterbalance happening or you don't remain in balance. So again, left foot up in the air, balancing over four. So now try the other foot, stand on your left foot, lift up your right leg, and you should feel yourself balancing over number two. Okay, so anytime your leg is up in the air or anytime you're on one foot, there's a counterbalance happening. Um, okay, so now stand on your left leg and do a forward arabesque. So left leg in the middle of the beam or on your floor, wherever, <laughs> wherever you're watching. And if you do an arabesque and you lean forward, so me standing on my left leg, I don't know if you can see this in the video, but I'm actually centered over number two right now. It's a lot more slight than having your foot off to the side, but you can tell because I'm on one foot, I'm still a little bit over the side of the beam, not directly placed over three. So now try it with your other foot, right leg arabesque, lean a little bit far forward, and you can see you're more balanced over four, okay? So when I do that arabesque and I lift my arms up and I go like this, you can see it looks like the beginning of a cartwheel or an aerial or a round off or a side summy. All of these skills with a one-legged takeoff, there's a counterbalance happening. Um, and all of those skills, they don't actually happen most efficiently over the center of the beam. So for any of, you, any of you that did aerials on the beam, you can probably recall that strange feeling where you need to lean over the edge of the beam. I remember feeling this when I was competing. You feel like you have to lean a little bit to the side or you're not gonna be able to land in the middle. You can feel it with aerials with round offs, all sorts of skills that have that counterbalance happening. Um, and that's the number system, leaning over to the side. Most of the time, the kids are already using the system. They feel this side to side shifting and they're making changes to counterbalance. Or if they do a back walk over one way and then a back handspring the other way when they're doing their series, they're using the number system. They're making directional changes. They're doing over corrections. So they've already been using it. They use it daily in their beam training. So when I explain this, typically the gymnasts grasp the concept a lot faster than the coaches because they're already feeling it daily. So for me, as a lefty cartwheeler, I need to start with my left foot in front. And when I go into a cartwheel, I need to lean over number two to, to deal with the counterbalance of me being on my left leg. So I'm leaning over two for the cartwheel. 
And then at the end of my cartwheel, my right leg will be in front and I need to pull my left hip down to align with number two. Okay, so when I'm coaching beam, I tell the kids pull your hip down to the beam or press your hip down to the beam rather than pull your foot down to the beam. Because if you can see, <laughs> if I'm landing a, a skill like this, I can pull my foot down to the beam like this or like this, which are two very different landings. So I tell them to press their hip down to the beam. So looking straight on like that, if I'm landing my cartwheel, I'm pressing my hip down and my left hip is pointing towards number two. So for the younger kids, the way I explain this is I say, pretend you have flashlights on your hips. So those are like headlights of a car. And when you're landing and when you're doing your skills, I need your headlights to be shining down number two and four. So that's squaring their hips. It applies for their shoulders as well, which I'll talk about later. But it's just an easy way to get the kids to understand how to align themselves in the middle of the beam by using those white lines. So cartwheel numbers are pretty simple because for a lefty, it would be two for the lunge or the step number and then two for pulling their hip down where for a righty, it would be four and four. So I usually use side handstands and cartwheels to explain this concept because I think it's the easiest to feel. So what this tells us is that it's not always ideal to aim for the middle of the beam. And if you ask kids, what are you aiming for? A lot of times kids don't even really understand what aiming is. They're really just trying to go for the skill. So if you ask them, where are you aiming? I would say probably 10 times out of 10, they're going to say towards the middle or towards three if they're looking at a laser beam. And it's just because they don't know about this system. They've never really had this experience before. Aiming for the middle of the beam seems to make a lot of sense, which is what we've been telling people in the gym forever before this concept came to be and before we all heard about it, before I knew about it, that's what I was doing as a kid and that's how I was coaching. Um, but then once I understood the number system, I understood how to use it, it opened up this whole new world of different sections of the beam. So as I was saying, um, if they're looking at the laser beam, if they're directing all of their skills towards three, it's not always going to result in a perfectly landed skill. So the number system opens up the ability to place their center of gravity over one, two, three, four, or five, depending on a few things. So it can, it can depend on the part of the skill that they're doing. So there's gonna be a number for the beginning, for the middle, for the end. You can have any amount of numbers throughout a skill. Um, it can also, you can also change numbers based on their tendencies. So if you have a kid that always does their series to one side, they're always landing on the same side of the beam, numbers can help them bring that back to the middle. Um, if you have a kid that has limited mobility, so I personally had an athlete that got sh shoulder surgery and she was super hypermobile, but when she recovered from her shoulder, shoulder surgery, she wasn't able to lift her arm up all the way, so she was limited. So her skills, we had to shift her numbers a little bit over to the other side to counteract what was happening because of her lack of mobility. So what these numbers help with is kids like that, you know, that have lack of mobility or a certain tendency or whatever, it allows you to use the beam in a completely different way. That's not just go to the middle, you know, jump to the middle, land in the middle of the beam, because there's so much more to it than that. Um, so at this point, when I explain this to athletes, at this point, I usually tell them to play with the system. So I'll have them do a cartwheel over two or four, depending on if they're a righty or lefty. Um, I'll have them do one over five. So I'll tell them, hey, like, go for go into your lunge and Try to put it over five or or one or two and a half like i want them to play with it and feel the different shifting of weight i also have them try one over three which is really what they were trying to do for a long time but then once they understand this they realize when they center their cartwheel over three it typically results in a wobble or some sort of save so i have them play with it because what they're doing is they're showing that they have control over their skills so they can make it land perfectly they can make it land off to the side um, but the biggest reason we're scared of something is because we feel like we don't have control over the outcome. So when the athletes feel like they have control over their skills, fears reduce substantially. So we're going to look at a few cartwheel examples now. If you're kind of not understanding the concept quite yet, that's okay. It does take a lot of time to get used to. It takes some playing. It takes you coaching the athletes or the athletes actually feeling it. It does take some time. So if it's a little bit confusing right now, that's totally fine. But hopefully these examples will help. Um, okay, so we're going to look at some cartwheel numbers now. The first example is a side handstand, which is the beginning of a cartwheel, but it's also the compulsory dismount. So when getting new level threes to turn the correct way, you don't want to tell them like direct your toes over to the side of the beam or point your toes that way. I've tried that before and it's not correct because it usually ends up in an arch. So they're trying to kick up to this archy handstand because it will make them turn, but obviously we don't want that. We want a nice tight body handstand that can hold, that can be nice and straight and can turn the correct way. 
Um, so let's watch this video. In this first attempt, the athlete lunges and leans directly over three, the middle of the beam. Let's go ahead and watch. And so she just did a nice tight handstand right over the middle of the beam, but she wasn't thinking about two or four, or four for her because she's a righty, and she didn't make the turn. So then in the correction, I said, do the same tight handstand, but lean over four because she's a righty. So she kicks to the nice handstand right over four. You can see there's just a little bit of an angle change there. And she pushes up super, super tall and she's able to make that turn. So now in this next cartwheel, you can see she's positioned right over the middle of the beam. So over three, but the nature of a cartwheel is not to be over three. So she ends up a little bit off to the side. I then had her lean over number two because she's a lefty and she lands perfectly square in the middle of the beam. You can kind of see just that slight shift of gravity and how much more control she had. In this last one, she's a righty. She attempted to lean over four, but she opened up her hips at the end. So the correction I gave her was to lean over four again at the beginning, but pull her hip down to four to square at the end. So now she's looking at the opposite numbers of us. Okay, so this next one that we're gonna look at is an aerial. So I want you to watch how she lunges and leans over three, but she turns way too early. <laughs> um, and she actually directs it more towards two or even one, which puts her way off to the side. So this is just kind of a, a mess of an aerial here. <laughs> Um, in the second attempt, she leans over four at the beginning, but she overcorrects and opens up her hips at the end. And then she finally successfully leans over four, squares, and pulls her hip down to four at the end for a clean landing. Okay. Um, hopefully you guys can see that. Hopefully the slow-mo helps a little bit. But again, as Kelly was saying, this is going, the recording is going to be emailed to you. So if you want to go back and look at these videos, you can. If you have any questions at the end, we're going to do a little Q&A. Um, so if you wanted me to re-explain something, we absolutely have time to do that. Um, okay, so moving on just to just some things I do when I'm coaching beam. Um, I always stand at the end of the beam. So when I'm on the side of the beam, when I'm watching them this way, I can tell them if their legs are bent, I can tell them if they have flexed feet, arms bent, you know, things like that. But I can't really tell them why they fell. So if I'm at a meet and I'm watching from the side and, and at this point they, they should be pretty consistent with their skills. Ooh, sorry, there was a fly. <laughs> they should be pretty consistent with their skills. Um, and so I'm, if I'm over at the side and they're warming up for their beam routine and they, they do a good series, but they look at me and they say, why did I fall? I'm not really going to be able to tell them why they fell. So I stand at the end of the beam because I can tell them why they fell, when it happened, what went wrong, what body part it was, and how to fix it. So coaches, this reinforces so much trust between you and your athletes. They know that you can see and understand what they're feeling, and you know how to get them to stay on the beam. The clearly marked numbers and lines give you and your athlete an easy way to communicate about the changes they need to make. And then once they're ready to put it on the high beam, they kind of just visualize those lines. Personally, all of our beams in my gym have little chalk marks on them because the girls like to have that visual. Um, but yeah, but that's how you essentially take it over to the high beam. Um, when I have an athlete struggling to do like a back handspring and they're standing up on the beam frozen, they're scared, they, they feel like they can't go. I, I go up to them and I say, what are you thinking about? And 99% of the time they say, I'm just telling myself to go. I'm just saying go over and over, you know, and I, and I asked them, me as a coach, if I came in here every day and I didn't say anything else, I just stood next to the beam and I said, go, just go, go for it. You know, am I a good coach? And they'll usually say, no, you know, and I'll say, I know it's okay, you know, but you need to be a good coach for yourself too. You need to be directing yourself through your skills. You need to have helpful cues. You need to be thinking of productive things to get you through this skill. And just telling yourself to go is not being super productive. And what's happening here, most athletes are just focusing on jumping. They're not thinking about their direction of movement or how to land the skill. They're just thinking about jumping and hoping for the best. And that is pretty scary. <laughs> so when they're scared of those skills and those are the cues they're telling themselves, I tell them, I understand. Just kind of doing a blind jump with a blank mind is scary. Um, they don't feel like they have as much control when they're doing that. So how do we reduce this fear? Athletes should never be throwing a skill with a blank mind. Blank minds make room for fear to sneak in. So this is where cues come into play. I'm sure everyone has heard of cues, uh, mental cues. I like to call them equations, actually. So I ask, ask the athletes, if you knew you would always land on the beam, would you be scared? The answer is obviously no. Um, I then ask them if two plus two always equals four. The answer is yes. Leonard explained that gymnastic skills are like an equation. If you plug in the correct numbers, you will always get the right answer. So if you follow your numbers and cues, you get a perfectly landed skill. So two plus two equals four their cues and all the things they need to think about equals a perfectly landed skill. So I create these personalized equations for my athletes um, for what they say in their head every time they do a skill. 
and there's always a big range, you know, because there's some there's some kids that need to think about shrugging taller in the when their hands are on the beam in their back handspring, or some that need to think about squaring their hips at the beginning. Um, so you can change the numbers. I usually do a mix of like numbers and cues. So for example, for a back walkover back handspring, I might tell them at the beginning they need to pull up tall. So for a righty back walkover, and then at the end of their back walkover, I'm telling them to push their hip down to two, so step into two, and then I might tell them stretch for their back handspring, and then two again when they land. So their cues might be tall to stretch two. Usually for series, I start with two cues like that, two cues per skill. Um, you, can, you can get more advanced with it, you can add more in. Um, if it's a single skill, you can add a couple. Um, it just it just depends on what's right for the kid. I usually start with four for their series, so they're, they're thinking about something at the beginning and the end of each skill. So they repeat this before they go and during their skills, and I repeat it as I stand behind the beam. So as they're doing their back walk or back handspring, I'm saying tall two, stretch two, tall two, stretch two, and they're repeating it over and over and over. Um, and these equations can change too. Two plus two equals four, but so does one plus three. So numbers will not be the same for different athletes, for, for this, numbers will not be the same for different athletes. And each athlete's equation will change over time depending on improvements, consistency, and those off days. So if that same kid that's using tall two, stretch two, is maybe having a day where they're not, they're not open, or they're not squaring their hips as well at the, in, during the connection, or they're doing something weird with their shoulders, maybe they did a, you know, a bunch of arm exercises the day before, and they're not feeling super extended in their shoulders, they, they're feeling a lack of mobility, I might say something a little bit different. I might direct it towards two and a half or, or three, even if they're going a little bit more to the side. So these can change at all times. These are completely adaptable and they will not be the same across the board for different athletes. Um, and it's nice that the number system is a little bit confusing at first and that remembering their equation takes some concentration because the whole time they're concentrating on remembering their numbers, they're actually taking their focus away from being scared. So if you focus on the right things, you don't have time to think about the wrong things. So even, even as I'm explaining this to kids that are kind of starting to understand it and they're just kind of playing with it, I, sometimes I play with it on a skill that they're scared of. Maybe they're scared to do their back handspring on the high beam. I take them down to the number, or I take them down to the laser beam. I explain the number system. I give them an equation and we're just talking through it and they're trying so hard to remember their numbers. They're just doing back handsprings and they're, they're getting reps in, they're working on it on the laser beam and they're so focused on the right things. There's no time to think about being scared. There's no time to think about what if my hands slip off or what if I die, <laughs> you know? So they have to flood their brains with positive, productive things. All right, so we are gonna take a look at a few athletes using the number system for their flight series. So in this first example, the athlete's shoulders are not square when she's on her hands, which sends her over to the right. So this was a pretty simple one. I just, the correction I gave her was just to square your shoulders in line with two and four, because she's normally pretty straight with everything else. See, so she, she steps down nice, and then she's thinking about where her shoulders are in line with those white lines. And then she lands much straighter. In the second example, the athlete opens up her hips at the end of her back handspring, which sends her over to the right. So the correction I gave her was press your left hip down to two at the end of the back handspring and then lift your hips to two and a half. So you can kind of see her hips are open. She tries to fix it by going right in the middle and it's just not enough. So in the second turn, I said, press your left hip down to two at the end of the back handspring. So you can see she's making that correction, pressing her hip down, and then lifting her hips to two and a half to overcorrect, which puts her more square in the beam. This last example, this athlete is pretty flexible, so she tends to open up her hips at the end of this aerial a lot. I would say nine times out of 10, she's falling off the beam to the left. When I asked her to think about what she thinks about in the layout, she says she jumps to the middle of the beam to fix it. But obviously we know that that's not gonna work because she's already off to the side. So the correction I gave her was press your right hip down to four at the end of the aerial. So as you can see, she's still a little open, but then she pulls down, pulls that hip to four. And then I told her, press your hips to three and a half in the layout. So she needed a little bit of an overcorrection. And then she presses that hip right down to two as she lands. Okay. So the number system reinforces the fact that a skill or series is not over until it's over. We all, <laughs> sorry, there's a flat. Um, we all have those athletes that won't go for their series unless the first skill is perfect. You know, they won't go for the back walkover back handspring until the back walkover feels absolutely perfect. But we all know gymnastics is not always perfect. And I always tell them, I need you to understand how to do, how to go even when the back walkovers don't feel perfect because it might happen at a meet. You know, there might be a little, there might be 
a sideways back walkover at a meet and you're going to go for it because you're competing and you don't want the first time you have to deal with that correction to be at a meet. So I encourage them no matter where it is, I mean, as long as it's not like crazy off the beam, you know, if it's a little bit off, I still want them to go because I still want them to be understanding how to fix that. You know, because if we do a million back walkovers until they're perfect, that results in 10 million back walkovers and a really sore back. So not ideal for longevity in the sport. So the number system prepares the athletes for those kind of situations where they can make number changes in the middle and re-square the second still skill and still land on the beam. So this promotes more intentional, high quality turns and less overuse injuries. And it helps them stay on the beam at meets too. We don't want them to give up at, at any point in practice or, or in the meets, but it really could help it could help a score if they understand how to make those changes they understand how to keep themselves on the beam that makes a big difference in competition so now let's look at some other ways to use the number system one way is teaching landing positions for sideways landing jumps it's very common that we see the athletes using a pike save and dropping their chest which is what you see in the picture to the left so that's when they're landing their jumps and they have they already have a little bit of chest down maybe it's a straddle jump and as they're coming down they pike save and they lean forward like that to try to get themselves to maintain balance we see this more than an arch save because it's just not as natural. Um, so we see that chest dropping, which obviously results in a deduction and possibly a fall. Um, so on the second turn, I told her to spot the end of the beam and pull her shoulders back and down to four on her landing. So you can see that in that picture on the right. She's looking right down the line of number four and she's pulling her shoulders back and sitting back. So moving on to some dismounts. So in a righty round off dismount, which is what, which is what this athlete is, Starting from the left leg step before the hurdle, you want to think about stepping to two. So visualize that in your dismount. You want to think step to two and then pull that good leg knee over to three to center yourself. And then as a righty round off, you want to be leaning over four. So then for a righty dismount, you would say two, three, four, where a lefty would be four, three, two. You can add another number at the end because if the righty round off was coming down, and you are pulling that back foot in, you can also pull that hip down to four. So a righty round off can be two, three, four, four, where a lefty can be four, three, two, two. If that makes sense. Um, okay, so we're gonna watch a righty round off dismount, and I want you to watch as the athlete performs her first round off lunging directly over three, which we now know is not going to help with the counterbalance. So you can see she ends up pretty sideways. And then in this last one, she leans over four, which puts her right in the middle at the end of the round off. So we should be seeing step to two, knee to three, lunge to four. Okay, so then let's take that round off over to a different event. Like I said, you can use the number system virtually across any event. It was started on men's equipment. It was taken over to women's equipment. Um, obviously we do round offs on vault and floor and beam as well. So we can use it in round offs, but I'll also go into a couple other skills. Um, so you can use the numbers to fix a cross step on vault. This is the main way that I use it on vault. Um, you can explain the placement of the foot before the hurdle, as well as the direction of the foot when it, leans, when it leaves the floor. Um, so this example is a typical cross step that we see in a Yurchenko. This is a pretty bad one, <laughs> but when she picks up her left foot, it drifts over to four, causing the hurdle and the right leg step to cross over towards two. So I would tell this athlete, left leg steps towards two, hurdle and pull right knee to four to kind of separate it. So. And for anyone that coaches vault, we obviously understand how having that cross step can really affect a Yurchenko. It can make a, it can, um, it can make for a really messy round off, not resulting in the best vault that we want. Um, but I like to use the laser wings for vault drills as much as possible if they're available that day. I do a lot of cartwheel step in work um, where I have the kids hurdle from the beam, step on either side, and cartwheel step in on the beam. Um, and when I say step on either side, we obviously don't want a round off that's stacked like this on vault. That doesn't really make sense for the event. But I'll have them hurdle on the beam and I'll have them hurdle step step so they're right on the edge of the beam and so they're right in line and then they can do their cartwheel step in on the beam or I can put a springboard behind it and they can go cartwheel step in snap back you know just um, whatever drill with a cartwheel I wouldn't have them like run and actually do <laughs> a Yurchenko on this but having them feel those steps and squaring their hips before they get into the cartwheel it kind of breaks down the pieces of the round off to avoid cross steps. So one more extremely helpful use is for pirouetting elements on bars. You can instruct the athlete to shift their weight over number two to pick up their hand and then place that hand on the bar and shift their weight back over to number four during the, during the turn. The colors on our perfect placement bar make it really easy to communicate with the athletes as well. And it was kind of created like with the number system in mind. Um, so it's a really cool piece of equipment. 
Um, you wouldn't want to see this much sideways movement in a pirouette um, as is pictured, but I had the athlete kind of over exaggerate a little bit just for the presentation. Um, but you can see she's, she's shifting her weight over number two, picking up her hand, turning it, and then shifting back over to number four. So you can use this. This, this helps a lot with pirouetting elements on bars. Um, all right. So I only highlighted a few here, but there are tons of different ways you can use the number system. I really like to use it for turns on beam and floor. Um, whether it's sideways movement or actually flipping it and having them go one, two, three, four, five. So if they need to step forward for a full turn or step out that way for a one and a half turn. So there's lots of different ways to use it. Um, balance and center of gravity and weight shifting are obviously essential with gymnastics training. And one of my favorite parts about explaining this concept is hearing all the creative ways people take it back to their gyms and use it. Uh, recently, I had someone tell me that they were having issues with a group of kids that didn't know how to walk with their feet turned out. So they were walking I think it was just on floor. They were walking with their toes turned in like that. And we know with the compulsory routines, every step should be in turnout. So to get to get the kids to understand how to walk in turnout, she actually put them on a laser beam and she had them take a right leg step and think about turning their heel out towards four. I mean, out towards two. And then doing a left leg step, turning their heel to four. So as they're walking, they're feeling that heel pulling to the opposite side. I'll go back here so you guys can see. <laughs> So as they're walking, they're, they're turning their heel, pulling it out to the side of the beam, and it's, it helps them understand how to walk in turnout. So I thought that was really cool. I thought it was really creative. It was something I hadn't thought about using it in, uh, before. But like I said, that's my favorite thing, because I, I usually get a lot of feedback where people have some creative way that I've never thought of, um, and it's really fun. So that is all I have. Um, thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys, some, I hope you guys got some good information from this presentation to take back to your home gyms. I hope it helped your athletes train better train smarter, train safer. Um, the, graphics, the graphic that's shown here on the screen is actually a little inside joke from us at Tumble Track, and Carrie has it on her shirt as well. It says, if you know, you know, because we all know the true meaning behind the lines and numbers, and now you know. So welcome to our exclusive <laughs> Tumble Track Club. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Carrie in a second here. She's gonna run our Q&A. So if you have questions for me, please put them in the chat. We have plenty of time for me to answer questions. I know this can be a complicated thing to understand. Um, but go ahead and put those questions in the chat. And she's also going to do our $250 giveaway. So stay yeah, tuned. But thanks so sorry. much, Leah. That was so fantastic. It just, it makes me so happy. The laser beam has been in circulation now for many years. And I love that people today hopefully gained a better understanding about the number system and really what Leonard intended the beam for with his innovation. Um, you saw in the presentation that there were, that, you know, Leah has two different versions, our original versions behind her. The Laser Beam Pro is the long one. And then the two lights on either side. Recent, in recent years, we added to the Laser Beam family, we're calling it. Um, in the middle photo and on the left and in the dismount, um, that in the presentation, the athletes doing dismounts, they were using the laser beam training pads. That's the full length of the beam. It's made of what we like to call a perfectly dense foam. It's dense, but still soft enough for those athletes. Um, when they impact the beam, they're going to um, feel a little bit of softness. And then on the right there in the middle row is the laser beam conversion top. That's more of a solid wood beam with a little bit of padding on top, similar to the Laser Beam Lite and Laser Beam Pro. You plop that on top of the beam. Both the pad and the conversion tops do strap underneath. Um, you can use that on low beam or the competitive beam. The conversion top is just eight feet long, so you'll need two to cover 16 feet, um, and then you still have a little bit of four inch at the end as well. Um, we also added a laser beam hammock. So you can see in those photos below, because the laser beam light is one solid piece of wood, folks were wanting to use it a little more suspended. And so the hammock does use webbing to um, support the laser beam light. And you can hang it from your ninja rigs or parallel bars, and it can be really fun for your little ones or ninjas in obstacle courses. So 
Also, um, we do get a lot of calls. I mean, as we mentioned, the laser beam's been around a long time. We see the laser beam um, in, on social media everywhere. One of the free, most frequently asked questions that we get is uh, replacements for the screws underneath the Laser Beam Pro or co uh, new covers. And those are available on our website. And as well, a little bit of a tip for the Laser Beam Pro, because it is in three different pieces, if you can turn the laser beam pro and teach your athletes to turn it on its edge as you're carrying it from one place to the other, that's really going to help. When you carry it flat like this, it does put a little bit of strain on those joints. So that's a good practice. The laser beam care and frequently asked questions. We plopped in the handout. You can download it um, directly here from the event or we'll also send it in a link in a follow-up email after the presentation. So now for your questions, Leah, I did see that during the chat, um, there was a question or two. And so the first one was from Matt. Thanks, Matt, for the question. Can you touch on using the number system for front walk over and front aerial? And I happen to know that that's one of Leah's favorite skills to do. <laughs> I do love the front aerials, yes. Um, well, I would say it's it's pretty consistent with the initial number in the cartwheel. So as a as a righty, if you were going into the front aerial, going over number three wouldn't be perfect because it is a counterbalance going into that skill. Um, I wouldn't say it would be as aggressive as four um, with the cartwheel. I would direct myself more towards three and a half, which is what I do when I go for those. Um, so you can have half numbers as well if you want to change it. Um, it doesn't have to be as aggressive as four. We don't typically use one and five a ton. I use it when I explain it, just so the kids are feeling those changes. Um, but it is a little bit more slight when they're when you're working with them. So I would have them start with three and a half if they're a righty, or two and a half if they're a lefty, and think about lunging over that number. Um, and then if they needed a change, if if four worked better for them, I would move on to that. But I would always go half numbers rather than like a full number jump. I feel like usually that's a little bit easier for them to understand and make those little those little shifts. Awesome. Great. Any other questions? Let's see. I'm going to scroll through a little bit. You know, Leah, one of the questions that we get often is, um, is it difficult for athletes going from a seven inch wide laser beam and then transitioning skills to the four inch competitive beam? What do you what's your opinion there? Um, I feel like it's actually an easier transition because what the laser beam provides is a wider, softer surface um, that they can train and they can develop these cues. I am a huge contender for going, going back to the laser beam. I will never shame a kid for needing to go back to the lower beams. I think it's great. I think sometimes their mind is ready to go on the high beam, but their body is not. So I am all for letting them stay on the laser beam for as long as they need. I want them to ask me, can I go on the high beam now? I don't want to have to tell them, you should be up there. You need to be up there. You know, so when they're on the laser beam, they're working on these numbers and, and these cues. They're getting a bunch of reps in. It's nice and safe. It's a nice, easy surface. Um, and they're, they're getting, gaining that consistency on a safer surface. Um, so then when they do bring it over to like a skinnier low beam or to a high beam, they have that same consistency. They're visualing the lines. Visual, visualizing the lines, um, they have the consistency from their cues and from all those reps, and it's easier for them to take it over. But I think when they're, you know, when they're, when they're up on a high beam, like if they have the mats stacked all the way up or something, and they're kind of just throwing themselves through it, and then going up to that high beam, I feel like it's not as progressive as taking the time to do the consistency on a line, on a laser beam, having that, that nice, easy, consistent series or whatever skill they're doing, and then bringing it up there. And I, I really, really like the training pads and the conversion tops because it, it allows for a completely different environment for them. You know, obviously on the laser beam, they're not super scared to go here, um, or they shouldn't be if they have the physical prep on the floor. Um, but, but, but going up on a high beam presents a different challenge. So they know that the mats are not, or the, they know that the floor is not right next to them. They're at a higher, um, a higher level. But putting the laser beam up on a high beam with the use of the training pad and the conversion top allows them to still feel that safety of the wide beam, but then they're standing up higher. So I like that because it's, it's different than having them, you know, go straight from the laser to a high beam. 
um, it allows for kind of a step in between. Yeah. Okay, I see a couple more questions. Uh, folks are dropping a couple more questions. Let's see. Uh, would you recommend a laser beam for home use? Is it a good is it good for parents to consider for their athletes at home? What do you think? Um, yeah, I absolutely think it's great for home. Um, a lot of my athletes have laser beams at home. Um, I think, you know, if they have a fear, if they're kind of starting out with playing some of the playing with some of these skills, um, it allows them to kind of have that time to play with it at home where they're in the comfort of their own home. They're doing those nice safe reps and everything and they're playing with their numbers. Um, it's also it doesn't take up that much space. You know, the, the light is only eight feet long. Um, it allows for easy storage if they do have two eight foot sections and they can put them together. Um, it's, and it's low to the ground. It's not going to damage the floors or anything. We suggest using it with a panel mat underneath just for added safety if they are on like hardwood floors or like harder carpet or something. Um, but it's definitely a piece of equipment that's easy to have. It yeah. On. So as Leah mentioned, the laser beam light, although it's eight feet, it does have Velcro on the end so that you can Velcro two together to make 16 feet. So a little bit easier to store at home for sure. All right, I see Adam has a question. Is the beam sturdy enough to suspend between two booster blocks for cartwheels, back walkovers, and back handsprings to step out? Can it handle that amount of force? And <laughs> it cannot handle that amount of force. Um, I have seen people do this before, and I understand like the appeal of making it higher. Um, but it is not meant to be used that way. So it will bend in the middle, yeah. which would be sad. So we would not recommend using it that way. Um, you can put it up on booster blocks. Um, so Tumble Track does have these blocks that are raised off the ground, or if you have spotting blocks that are sturdy enough to put it up on there, that's a nice way to, write, to raise them up off the ground. Um, but I would suggest the conversion top and training pad for that. Yep. Robin's question, does it take up a lot of space? I think we touch on that the eight foot version being um one that you can disconnect and throw underneath the bed or underneath the couch that's where mine lived when i had one at home with my athlete um and the 16 foot just so you know when it does ship like i mentioned earlier it ships in three different pieces um, and there are some steel plates underneath that connect the three pieces together it is a little bit trickier to dis. You wouldn't want to disassemble that every day in your living room. In your living room, so the eight-inch versions are definitely better for saving space in that way. Uh, let's see. So this question: Can you Velcro it to the ground on flexi roll? Oh, on a flex rod, flex rod floor, mod floor, or flexi roll? Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the Velcro flaps actually only open to Velcro to another beam. Um, I can actually show you guys. So it allows you to connect them together, but not to connect to the floor. So these flaps, you Velcro like this, you can open it up. And then the other side of the laser beam has Velcro. And then you just put this around and then close the flaps so that they're Velcro together. But it will not reach to the floor, no. unfortunately. Yeah, so many great questions. Thanks so much for adding. Um, this would be a great piece of equipment to have a poster to display all the images. Good idea. <laughs> okay, so um, let's see. I would love to introduce you to our sales team. This is Shelly and Jen. You might see Shelly and Jen at shows when we're out traveling. Um, but it, should you have any other questions, feel free to check in with them via the phone. I mean, you can always order on the website, but Shelly and Jen and the rest of our Tumble Track team are available to you should you have any questions. Um, and now that you know, we would like to offer this code, I know 23 for 15% off any laser beam product, those that we mentioned earlier. So right now we're in our August Sale. We're in the last couple of days of our August sale, so all of our products are 15 per tumble track products are 15% off currently. But we've extended that 15% discount for those of you who are here using this promo code all the way through September 22nd. So if you're not ready to purchase in the August sale, you have a little bit of extra time um, to grab that laser, those laser beams. 
I'd love to invite you to join us on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, you'll see us post a lot of training tips and education. And the other thing, I'd love you to tag us. Tag us with your athletes and what you've learned today in the laser beam. We would love to see you applying all of the stuff on your laser beams in your gym and home. Um, we'd also like to invite you, this is the third event, but we have several events that happen over the course of the year. Tumbletrack.com slash events is where you'll see our full listing of events. But we do have right around the corner, September 12th, at 12 p.m. Eastern, we will be featuring Brett Wargo. Brett is um, a coach at Ascend Gymnastics. He's on the national team staff. He is coach of Shilise Jones. I'm sure he's celebrating right now after a great weekend last weekend. And he's also a tumble track um, R&D innovator. He innovated the bar pad, which uh, the porcupine bar pad, which you see him holding in that photo as well as the mountain bar system, which has been so popular. Check that out. You can register at tumbletrack.com slash events for that one. All right, it's time for our $250 giveaway. So Leah, our chat has been so active. I'm gonna scroll through a little bit and randomly stop. You do have to be present to win, so I'm gonna call out your name and when I do, just um, drop a little woohoo in the, the chat to let us know that you're here. Leah, give me a number uh, between 1 and 25. Um, seven. Let's go with All right, seven. here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Lindsay from Hot Springs, Arkansas, are you still here? I hope. Lindsay, 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 $250 on the line. Oh, goodness gracious. All right, three, two, one. I'm going to go to the next seven. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. How about Raphael from Illinois? Oh, goodness. Am I going to win? Um, <laughs> let's see. I'm here. <laughs> All right. One, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven. Robin, I know you were fighting for it. Robin, you were my next pick. Is Robin still here? Yay, Robin's here. Robin is the winner of our $250 gift certificate. Um, congratulations to you, Robin. Well, and thank you. One final thank you to Leah at, for putting the presentation together. I'm so grateful that we did this. Thanks for taking the time. And also to Leonard for innovating the laser beam. And thanks to all of you for attending. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and see you at the next live event. Bye.